Ah, okay. Like usual, I'll get going in a couple minutes or so. If you got any kind of questions, anything, just want to express that you're you're feeling traumatized by my homeworks, anything like that, let me know. Uh, <clears throat> hit me up in chat uh, or complain verbally. Um, whatever. Hopefully, they aren't too bad. Next one isn't too bad either. And then from there, it's smooth sailing. Hmm. Also, let me know if I missed anybody's questions or a, a burst of Slack channel things and a couple of emails. And if anything snuck under my radar, let me know like in chat to go back and search for it. Might have missed it and not intentional if I did. I have a random question about courses in fall quarter because uh, registration just opened up and there's a class on Python, hmm. a David Beck. I'm curious, are you familiar with the class of the instructor? Familiar with the instructor. I chatted with him. Which, which, do you know which class it is? Yeah, it's called Software Development for Data Science. That class is dope. Is it? Um, yeah, so I, I sat in on that to learn more about teaching sort of um, programming for data science. Um, and stuff uh, that was when I when I sat in on it was run by a three person team it was also uh, Beck was there but it was also Bernice Herman at uh, eScience and somebody God who's the other person who's running anyway, utterly fantastic that is an exemplary class for learning um, sort of actual um, software development practices for data science it also te it'll teach you about using um, Git, doing proper pipelines it'll teach you some console uh, programming. Um, so that's actually one of the ones that I regularly recommended to people to take. It can fill up, unfortunately, quite fast, but all their materials are also online. That one, in my opinion, is very good. Awesome. Okay. I registered for it, and I think there's still slots if other people are interested. It looks looks good, and I'm glad to hear it gets your, your uh, thumbs up. Yeah, big time. No, I had a, I really enjoyed sitting in on that. Um, uh, it's a it's great. It's the kind of thing like they teach you all that stuff you wouldn't learn. I mean, you don't have time to learn in my class that I would love to be able to teach. Um, and it's rarely taught to people, especially like in social sciences, just, you know, fundamentally, how do you write good, usable production style code for, in the data science environment? And it's like project oriented. And it teaches you all that side stuff that you sometimes have to pick up on your own, like how to use Git and GitHub, because you actually turn in all the assignments via Git, a GitHub repo that you like push to. So you've got to learn it all. Um, and it's a really welcoming environment. Um, so I think it's probably great. How's the learning curve compared to this class? Um, one second. I was just asking my partner who took 583 way back then and I was asking her how it is, uh, how it was. And she said, um, it can vary depending on your previous fluency, but she felt like there's a lot of support available and it's welcoming to people sort of at all sort of different stages. So if you're, you know, you ask people around and you work with it, it's very manageable. Yeah. Are there other courses that you would recommend comparable to this one or that one that are good for kind of intro data science, uh, intro coding courses uh, for more social science oriented folks? Mm. My motivation for running this class was due to a lack of those existing to my knowledge at least years ago. Um, I don't know what the current status is. Um, I feel like there's one run, no, that's a boot camp. Um, yeah, I'm actually not very familiar. I wouldn't be surprised if with the data science initiative and other things going on, more stuff is developed, but I'm just not aware of it. Um, but that 583 is probably the, the one that I know of best. 
that people like, but you could probably ask, um, uh, like the instructor of that class is somebody in a much better position to know if there's other things out there. Um, so I'm not sure. And and also put out maybe this like channel, or even ask if there's other people here who are familiar with anything, if you, if you all know, um, you know, kind of crowdsource it, but I'm not super familiar myself. And I run this because of a lack of other options, in my opinion, for social science oriented people. Got it, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to get started here. Um, so today we sort of naturally follows uh, from last week's lecture, which I can't believe was only a week ago. Time has seems to be turning strange at the end of the term. But um, yeah, so this natural is a natural follow up. The idea behind today is essentially I taught you and probably scared you with some stuff about using loops and things like that. Um, and now I want to teach you how to avoid doing that as much as possible um, and how to write functions, do apply commands, things like that to get away from running loops. Sometimes we need to use them, but it's generally better not to. Okay. So before we get started on that, I want to have a quick aside here about general sort of programming um, uh, strategies. So before you can write any kind of effective code for any purpose at all, it's really important that you know and have visualized exactly what it is you want that code to produce. Like, what do you want that code to do? You can't write good code to do something if you don't already know what it is you want that code to do. And sometimes you think you know you want what that you want that code to do, but you actually kind of don't, and you need to sit back and plan it out more. So when I say what do you know what you want to produce, these are things like, do I know that this particular thing I'm doing needs to produce like a single value, one number? Does it need to produce a vector of numbers, a list of things, maybe particular objects? Is it going to produce a whole bunch of data sets or something? Um, when it comes to producing like a data frame, what do you want it to look like? Do you want to have one observation per person, an observation per person year, an observation per year, or per neighborhood, per continent, per person, you know, per neighborhood year or something like that. Like you need to know what your actual observations are going to be to get it in the appropriate sort of tidy or long format. So most programming problems, in my opinion, can be reduced to having an unclear idea of your end goal or your beginning state. That is, you've started writing code and you actually don't have a clear idea of what, what you want. And so you'll never really be able to get there or you have an unclear idea of what you actually have to start with. So you're trying to reshape or, or turn something that you're actually not sure how it um, is structured or works into something you maybe have a clear idea. So usually this is about like sketching things out, making sure you have a really clear idea of what it all looks like. So if you know exactly what you have, that is the data structure you're currently working with as hideous as it may be, and you also know exactly what you want, which is probably some beautiful clean data set that satisfies all of your desires for data, the intermediate steps usually become obvious to get from point A to point B. Okay? So when you're in doubt, my recommendation, at least if you're someone who's kind of visual like me, um, I like to sketch the beginning states of things and the intended end state. Big whiteboards are nice for this, but I often just use sheets of white paper and I sort of sketch what I think my current data look like based on what I see in like my console. And then I, I look at the end state and then I try and consider the sorts of things that could translate the beginning state into that end state, usually figure out the least complicated way. When I say least complicated, I don't mean the most elegant code or the fastest code. I mean mechanically what is the easiest operation to do that. And I have in the past literally gone so far as to cut out the cells in a drawn table with scissors and seen what it would take to mechanically rearrange them and written code that just literally does that rearranging operation. Because I couldn't figure out a way to do it, you know, without just looking at it. I'm like, I will just build something to translate these things to each other. Okay. If it seems complex to do that, try and figure out intermediate steps between that beginning state and that end state, break it into more steps until they make sense. Okay, I'll return to this later at the end of the lecture. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about today, main topic, is I want to talk about vectorization. I mentioned this a little bit last week when I was comparing sort of the speed of a looped operation versus a vectorized operation in R that is something that operates across all the elements of the vector at once. So if you remember from last week, um, I, I showed how much trouble it could be if you wanted to get the mean for every variable in the Swiss data set, right? I did mean this variable, mean this variable, and then put them together into a vector to show that it could be a huge pain that scales poorly if you want to manually calculate things. 
So the best solution to getting the mean of every column in the Swiss data set isn't even using the loop that I showed you as a more efficient way to do it. The way to do it is to run a function like column means and not think about things like writing a loop or, or pre-allocation or anything. The call means function will calculate the means of every variable in that Swiss data set and return to us a nice named vector of their names of each column and the values for their means. So don't have to do any of that loop garbage, no pre-allocation, no thinking about the structure of the data. You run a function and it returns what you want. Okay, so loops are a very powerful thing. Basically any programming problem you ever have can be solved with a loop. It's just sort of the nature of programming that is usually an iterative task you're doing. You can write a loop to solve it, okay? So this makes it sort of a, um, kind of like a Swiss army knife a big awkward Swiss army knife that cuts you all the time, but it's still a Swiss army knife, right? So the thing about loops is despite them being very powerful, they tend to be slower and they tend to require writing a lot more code than vectorized commands in R. Whenever possible, you should try to use vectorized commands to accomplish your goals. These are things like call means I showed in the last slide, but also basically everything in dplyr. Dplyr is a library for performing vectorized operations on your data. You might not have noticed it, but if you think about it, when you mutate something in Dplyr, it produces a value for every row in your data set simultaneously. Everything you do in mutate or summarize, whenever that is vectorized commands. These things take care of the stuff you might have to loop over in other languages. Nowadays, almost all programming languages are moving away from loops. Python is moving away from loops. Rust has moved away from loops. All the modern languages are trying to discourage people from using loops and instead use sort of um, vectorized style things like this and functionally uh, functional programming like I'll be talking about today. Okay, thing is though, sometimes no vectorized function exists to do the thing that you need to do. This is actually pretty common. And actually, usually what it is is a vectorized function does exist to do it, but you don't know what it is, and that's perfectly fine. Nobody knows every function out there in what you have installed, let alone in the entire world of R. When you run into this kind of case, you're gonna be tempted to write a loop to solve these tasks for you. Okay, I'll say, if it occurs to you immediately how to write a simple loop to perform an operation like that, and it's going to be a fast sort of one-time operation, your data aren't enormous, it's perfectly fine to write a loop. If any of those things do not apply, if your data are big, you're going to do it repeatedly, um, you need it to operate fast, I strongly recommend writing your own functions to do it and using different types of iteration operations to make that happen, which I'm going to talk about today. Okay. So first thing I'm going to talk about as a general topic is I'm going to talk about how to write functions in R so you can do all of those things that functions that we've been using all term do for you. Okay. So some examples of existing functions in R are literally everything we've been using that performs any operation in R, but some specific examples are things like the mean function. The mean function in R is a function which takes a vector of numbers as an input and it outputs a single number, which is the uh, mean, the average uh, calculated value of that input vector. dplyr's filter command is also a function. Its input, its first input is a data frame. We typically pipe a data frame into filter so we don't notice its first argument as a data frame. But it is, that piping sends a data frame to its first argument. Filter then, as all the rest of its arguments, by and large, are logical conditions, and you can give it a whole bunch of logical conditions. The output of the filter command is the original data frame with some of its rows removed based on those logical conditions. Basically, filter just lines up all the true values with rows in the data and discards everything else. That's all filter does, is it takes all those logical statements, puts them together, keeps all the truths. Another function we've used in this class is read underscore CSV in the reader package. This is a function which takes as an input, its main input is a file path to somewhere on your computer or online that has a CSV file. Optionally, it will have things like variable names or column types or something like that. The output of read CSV is a data frame which contains the info it reads in from that file. 
it is still just a function like everything else. And you could write your own read CSV command. Turns out actually isn't even that complicated to do. It just sort of opens the file in your computer, streams text into it, and parses that text into a data frame. Turns out it's not that complicated. If you take that 583 class, you'll end up doing that kind of thing manually in Python. It's pretty simple. Okay. So these are all functions. Somebody wrote all of these functions. A different person wrote all of these different functions or teams of people did them, but these are functions and they were written the same way we're going to write functions today. There's nothing magical about them. Somebody had to put all these things together themselves. They look complicated if you crack them open and look inside, but that's because people spend a lot of time writing and deal with all sorts of errors and problems like that. They're going to use the same, they use the same tools that we're going to use today. Okay, so why would you want to write your own functions? So the main use, use for functions is to encapsulate actions that you want to do often, some common tasks so you don't have to keep writing the same pile of code over and over again. The main reason people's like R scripts get really long is they repeat code. They're like, well, this performed this task, but I need to do it on 10 columns. So they just copy and paste the same code 10 times. Well, instead you could write a function that runs it across all those columns at once. And you've just written 10% as much code to perform the same task. And it probably runs faster too, okay? So encapsulated off uh, actions could include things like this, right? Maybe given some vector of data, we'd like to compute some special summary stats. We don't like what the summary function in R produces. Maybe we want a bunch of quantiles or something. Instead of manually calculating all those every time, we could write our own function that gives us what we want. This might be good if you were like working with an advisor who always asks for the exact same sets of summary statistics on everything in your data set and you need to put in a memo. Don't calculate them manually. Write a quick little function that dumps them out. So anytime you bring in new data or something, you can give them a memo that shows all that. My advisor is like that. He really wants to see the nitty gritty because he's somebody who's like an old school structural equation modeling guy. So he's like, I must see the variance covariance matrix myself. I do not trust you. And so I have to like calculate and give him these things. So I come up with functions to give them in a nice format. Another thing might be given some vector and a definition of valid values, replace all of the invalid values with NAs. This is the kind of thing you might do if you commonly work with survey data sets and you know you need to be able to put in like, I know in this data set 9999 is missing values. I need to be able to replace them all with NAs. Might be nice to encapsulate that in a function rather than doing it manually across every column or something. Other things would be like, um, maybe I have a template for my favorite ggplots, like you're picky about how they look, or you need to generate a lot of different ggplots, perhaps on demand, like you have an interactive dashboard. You might want to make templates. Lastly, maybe you want to define a new logical operator. This is something I don't do a lot, but there's one important logical operator that does not exist in R that I always have in all of my uh, um, scripts. And I'm going to show you today how to create that operator. Turns out operators like plus or pipe, you can create your own operators to perform tasks too. Okay? And I'm going to show you how to do it. So all four of these things, these encapsulated sort of actions, we're going to do an example of each one of these today to give you an idea of how sort of building functions works. Some advanced applications I'm not going to cover today would be things like writing functions to enable and to make smooth parallel processing. If you work with really large data sets, it's very useful and important to be able to parallelize operations so they go across multiple cores on your computer or across multiple computers in your cluster. If you're somebody who does a lot of work with like um, genetic data and biostats type stuff, sometimes you're going to be working with massive data sets. Um, parallel processing can buy you a lot of speed, but it requires a little bit of complicated programming because R, much like Python, is a single threaded language that by default only runs on one core on your computer, thus wasting 90% of the processing power of most modern computers. Okay, it's nice to be able to parallelize things. Other things are writing functions that generate other functions. That sounds kind of strange. Function factories, though, are a really common thing in R. The way that dplyr pipes work is they actually take all the syntax in the pipe chain and reassemble it into a new function call that is a new function and then execute that function. This is a function factories thing. We don't do it too often, but it can be really useful when you're writing packages and doing certain advanced things. The last thing that's not exactly writing functions is maybe you want to write a bunch of functions and you always want to use them in your projects. You could write your own little R package to do it. One of the most powerful, wonderful things about R is R has one of the easiest to use library or package generation systems of any programming language out there. It's very easy to make your own packages and distribute them like among your working group or in your department 
or uh, your business or something, and everybody can use the functions in their contribute tool and sort of manage the whole ecosystem of commonly used functions. Okay. So those are more advanced. Don't cover them in this class, but they're out there. Okay. So let's take a quick look at a simple function I've generated here. So recommendations uh, for resources for making packages. Yeah, the R Packages textbook by Hadley Wickham. So he has a free online textbook, which is also available as a print copy. That's R Packages. It's the best thing out there. There's nothing that can touch it. It's free and online. Google R Packages Hadley Wickham. You'll find it. Okay. So I think one of the things I love most about R, all the best texts in the R world are free and online. Every single one of them. So let's talk about this. Here's a simple little function here. This is a function here that takes as an input a vector of numbers. And all it does is it outputs the first and last elements of that vector. So the way this works is we're going to create a function called first and last. We're going to assign to first and last a function. So the thing to remember in R, the function that creates functions in R is function. Function makes functions. So we say function of x will make a function that takes x as an input. Then in the squiggly brackets, a lot like a loop, all the things inside the squiggly brackets will happen every time that function is run. So what happens? We're going to give first and last some input. That input, we're going to subset to its first element, assign it to the object first. Then we're going to subset this input to its last element, taking the length of x as a subsetting operation gets the last element. If something is length seven, length seven will return the number seven, thus subsetting it to its seventh element. We're going to assign that to last, and then we are going to return. Return means we're going to generate an output for our function. This is what's going to pop out when we run it. The output is going to be a vector that has an element named first, which contains the first value, an element named last, which contains the last value. Okay, So if we run this function, first and last on the vector 4, 3, 1, and 8, it outputs a length 2 vector. Its first element is 4. Its last element is 8. Okay? So this is kind of like a loop, but it don't only runs once. We don't iterate over anything, but it still works kind of like a loop in that everything in here runs one time for any input that we give to it. So here's a question. A great one. You have to label it even though you list it as first and last in the brackets. So the only thing these labels are doing here is creating the names right here. If I remove these labels right here, we'll just get four and eight, but we won't have the names first and last. So that's purely aesthetic, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you could try it out. If you remove first and the equals and last and the equals, run the exact same thing. It's just going to look exactly the same, but instead of first and last, it's just going to be the numbers. Can you use other arguments besides X or can you use multiple arguments? Anything you want. I like to use X because it's a really common thing where people tend to like to use X as the input to a function and Y is the output just as a conventional mathematical sort of notation. You can use anything you want. And in fact, later as we go, we're going to do multiple arguments and things like that. And we're going to use whatever we want. Um, I tend to just use X if it's going to take like a vector of numbers or something like a vector. But I always use more ex like better uh, explained arguments for literally anything else. Um, I tend to use like DF if it's going to take a data frame as an input, things like that. <clears throat> yeah. So here's uh, a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, how do we know that X is a vector over here? Like when we are writing a function, how are we knowing that it's a vector that we have to input? Ah, we don't. So if you try to give this function something other than a vector, it might get confused and kick an error or something if it doesn't know how to deal with it. I haven't put in here any code that forces it to take a vector. If you ran this function instead with like a data frame, it's probably going to freak out um, a little bit. Um, I'm just saying it takes a vector and I put that in the documentation and then I tell people if you give it something else, it's going to break. Um, but you could, like many functions in R, program it to make sure the input is a vector using if and else statements, which is something I think I'll show here in a minute. Um, but yeah, you could have to build that in yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. so those other questions. Do the functions save in R? So as soon as I run this code right here, this will then be in our global environment. And we can use it until we clear the global environment. So typically what I do is if I have a couple functions I create in a script or something or in like a project, 
um, I just load them at the start of the script um, or in like the top chunk of an RMD. If you have a lot of functions, I'll load them as an external script. If you have a lot and you're always using them, make a package. Um, but normally just load at the top of a script. I kind of wonder if I've got like an example uh, of where I do that. Um, yeah, I could probably go to, uh, let's go to like shared here, change my Zoom here so we don't see this terrible looking everything. Okay. okay. Uh, so, Let's go down through my mess of dissertation code. Where is this? Uh, I know somewhere, project function. So this is an example of something that I do like in my dissertation. Every single script in my dissertation, and there's a lot of them. I mean, once I've trimmed it down recently, there's probably about 60 or 70 main scripts in the, in the dissertation. Um, every one of them loads this R file when I start up the script. So if I look in one of these random scripts like this, right here, I have this function source. If you run source and give it an R file, it will run any of the code at that location. So it will just open up the script and run everything in it. If that script contains functions, it will add those functions to your global environment while that script is running. And so that's kind of a way that like a package preps and puts these things in your global environment. It's more primitive than a package, but it's a quick way to do it. Inside this function script, I have a whole bunch of functions I use to constantly run um, useful things for me. Some of these are like common things people want to do. Like this is a function for standardizing data, but allows you to be flexible on whether to use one or two standard deviations. I have this operator I'm going to teach you how to make later this class. And then I have some weird stuff in here that most people don't know about, like extracting empirical Bayes residuals from hierarchical measurement models getting reliabilities. These are things I have to do often in my dissertation. And so I have functions to do it. Um, yeah, but I just kind of do this and I just load this in my scripts and then they're there. So they don't technically save in the sense that like if I close out the, um, what I'm working on and open it back up, the function won't be there until I reload it, but I can just load it from a script like this and I've got what I want. Does that make sense? Okay, and if it doesn't, let me know if you got more questions, right? I don't mind. Um, yeah, okay, so we have this simple little function right here, okay? Um, so the thing is, what happens if I give to run this first and last uh, function that I wrote and I do something like give it a vector of length one, something I wasn't expecting when I wrote the function? Well, it doesn't give me an error. I haven't told it that it's not okay to have a length one vector. So instead it has some unusual behavior. First and last of just the number seven produces first is seven and last is seven. The reason for that is if you look back at the code on the last slide, well, if I subset the number seven to its first element, it's gonna give me a seven. If I subset the number seven to its last element, well, it's a length one thing, so it subsets to the same thing and it gives me the same number. So the first and last of a length one vector just gives me one number. That might be what I want, but it might not be what I want. I could make this function a little smarter, okay? Another thing here is what happens if I give it a length zero vector? This is a thing in R, you can have a length zero object. So if I say numeric zero, it generates a empty numeric vector, contains nothing. If I run first and last on a length zero object, it returns in an NA and it doesn't return the last place. It goes first, NA, last, nothing. The function breaks, but it doesn't kick an error. It doesn't like send out some error to let me know I've done something stupid with my function, okay? If we want it to let us know there's problems, we have to build that into the function. Okay, so in other words, we want this function to be at least a little bit smarter. Here, why do you have to specify numeric? Ah, that's a good question. So if you take and put in your console numeric zero, numeric zero will just generate a length zero vector. So the zero here is saying the length of the vector. This is the most convenient way to generate a length zero object or a length zero vector that I can think of. If I just put zero in there, it would be a length one object and it would just return to me zero and zero like this example up here. Does that make sense? This is kind of a weird concept actually that it's like, if I, come on, you can do it. Where's my alt tab? There we go, okay. If I do numeric zero, it returns numeric zero again, which is R's way of telling me this is an empty object. There's nothing there. You could also do, Character zero, same thing, it's a length zero object. 
length zero. Why are there length zero objects in R? They're useful for some things. I don't know any of them offhand other than examples, though. Okay. So uh, actually, there is one, one good thing a length zero one just could be is um, uh, sometimes you need to like, populate a section of a list, but make sure it has a data type. That's a common use of the length zero vector. Anyway, let's make this smarter. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this function we generated and make it a little bit smarter. When I say a little bit smarter, all it's going to do is kick out an error message when our vector is too small. So the original code for this function is right here. But what we're going to do is we're going to have the function run something before it actually does that sort of calculation or operation on the data. I'm going to call this function smarter first than last. I'm going to assign to it a function of x. It's still going to run a function of x. But now what it's going to do is it's going to check first. If the length of x is equal to 0, L may here is specifying as an integer. I think just doing equals equals zero would do the same thing. If the length is zero, stop running the function and holler the input has no length. This is how you write error messages in R. It stops running the function and it kicks out an error message. If the length is anything other than zero, that is else, if this is not true, else do all this, the function runs exactly as it did before. Okay, so we've built in an error message. Now I can say smarter first and last, if I give it a length zero vector, it's gonna create an error. Error in smarter first and last numeric zero, the input has no length. This was the error message I wrote. This is how every error message in R was written. They all were written manually like this at some point in the code. People had to actually code in every error message by hand using if and else statements and similar sorts of operations. It's how every kind of test in R works and in every other programming language that exists, basically. People had to write these tests so you can insert them into your functions. I very often put simple tests in my functions just to make sure I'm not doing incredibly stupid things, which without those tests, I would do all the time. So we see if I go smarter first and last on 4318, I get the same result. Four is the first, eight is the last. So the error checking catches the problematic thing and lets everything else by. Does that make sense? Kind of neat, huh? Sort of demystifies how these things actually work. Just turns out it's a lot of labor, like most things in life. Okay, so a neat thing about R is in R, uh, everything's pretty much open source. Um, you can see how every function in R was written for the most part. If you type the name of any function in R without its parentheses or arguments, just the name of the function, it will show you the code in that function. So in this function I just generated, if I just type smarter first and last with no parentheses, this is going to display in my console. This is the exact code that was used to generate the function in question. Okay. Another thing you can do is hover your cursor over a function in R, anywhere in a syntax file or R&D, and press F2. If you do that, it will open up the source of the function. So for instance, if I come over here and I do something like, uh, let's say, uh, table dot uh, matrix. Now, what is it? It's table dot oh, table work. Okay. This is the base R table function. Okay. So if you ever wondered how, when you run table on a vector or matrix or something in your data, how it works, it's not a mystery. You can look at all of the source code used to make the table function work. It will look like gibberish to you because it's a well-developed old R function with a lot of complex code going on inside of it. But as you get better at working with R, you can dig in and do things like borrow functionality from these things. Or maybe you downloaded a package that's out of date, people aren't updated anymore, and you need to fix problems in it. Um, one of the ways I actually got to know R really well was back in a bygone era, I took Chris Adolph's maximum likelihood estimation class, but I had to write a paper using an estimation method not well supported by uh, some of his code. So I actually took the package from his class and rewrote some of the functions in it 
to make them work for the estimation method I was using, um, which was very, very traumatic and took me a very long time to do, but I'm very stubborn and not good at giving up on things. And so I got to know how these things work inside really well doing that. Just know that you can do that. If there's something you need to do or it's in a package or something, it's not working, you can crack it open and see. You might not at this point and probably not for a while, you won't have the R expertise to really decode these things, but sometimes you can, you can find errors in it. And also maybe there's packages out there being developed by people like open source packages on GitHub and stuff. You can find and fix bugs in people's stuff, submit a request to it and get it fixed, um, which makes you feel good inside because you're contributing to the world of open source software. And that's actually how R and all these things out here exist is because of thousands and tens of thousands of people who constantly are fixing little bugs and stuff to make everything work a little bit better. It's one of the most like beautiful and democratic things that exists in the world of open source software. Um, so yeah, not that the people aren't often strange people you wouldn't want to associate with in an environment of any kind of socialization, but as a way to generate good software, open source is a good, sim good system. Okay, so nothing in R is generally a mystery to a degree. If you do something like like this, filter. Nope. Okay. Filter is actually pretty good. This is, however, the base R filter. If I go plier filter, you're going to get something like this. This is probably not what you were expecting. The filter function for dplyr is use method filter. You might be like, what does that mean? It actually means there's many different filter commands, different filter commands for different objects you give to filter. So if I say dplyr filter dot table df, what is it? Oh, it's a uh, filter dot uh, data frame. Then we get in here. This is the actual filter that runs on data frames instead uses another function called filter rows in dplyr, which looks like that. And this is the actual operation that filters your data. It turns out often a function actually just runs some other function and you go and find that one. It turns out it runs another function lower down. This is sort of how pipelines work. It can mean it can be sometimes difficult to actually track down what's actually being run on uh, your data when you do it. So just know it can be kind of crappy, um, but somewhere, somehow, you can eventually get at the code for literally everything in the R world, even stuff written in other languages like C++. What does the triple colon mean as opposed to a double? I'm glad you asked. So <laughs> the difference between the double colon and the triple colon, dplyr colon colon accesses all of the functions that you can access when you load library dplyr. But there's actually a lot more in every package in R than is exported when you load the library. So when you load a library, it exports certain functions for you to access, but it doesn't export everything in the library. If you want things that aren't loaded into your environment when you load the package, triple colon shows you everything. You want to actually see what's in dplyr? This is what's actually in dplyr. All of these functions. How do you load those functions I mean, if you go library deep liar, you don't get those functions. So do you always have to use triple colon to? You to should. You don't want to load them all because it's it's going to be you're 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 going to load a lot of things that are unnecessary. The things that are lower level down there only exist to be run inside of other deep liar functions. Um, they're what they're called lower level things. So often in documentation, you'll see like an example of like this is a you'll say they'll, they'll say something like this is lower level and not meant for direct user use. Um, every major package has often dozens or hundreds of these things. These functions only exist to be run inside of other functions in the package, and you're not meant to directly interact with them. So it's kind of like the functional architecture of the user functions? Yeah, these things are just the, um, so it's kind of like the things that you see dplyr that you actually interact with are technically an interface. They're, the dplyr functions like filter and stuff are basically a user interface for those lower level commands. So it's kind of the difference between, <clears throat> like if you use a phone, it's the difference between pressing buttons on your uh, interface here and opening up the, the hidden developer console on your phone and accessing things directly. They don't intend for end users to do that, but sometimes you might need to, um, but pretty rare. <clears throat> That's cool. Yeah. 
it always goes deeper. There's always something more hidden under the hood. <clears throat> anyway, okay. So now that I've shown sort of an example of a function, let's get into the abstract of it. Let's look at the anatomy of functions. So the anatomy of a function is like this. When you make a function, you have basically these components. You have a name, the function function. You give it arguments. These arguments may have defaults set to them. You have a body of the function that runs a bunch of code, and you have a return statement that specifies the output the function should produce. So the first part of this is the name. The name, like every other name of an object in R, is just what you assign this to so you can use it later. You can have functions with no name that are referred to as anonymous functions. I'm going to show examples of these later. Turns out you've been using anonymous functions all term without me telling you because it would have been more confusing to say you're using an anonymous function than to just use them, okay? Normally though, if you're gonna really write a function like this, you probably assign it to something. The next part of a function are its arguments. These are sometimes also referred to as its inputs or its parameters. Arguments are the things that the user gives to the function to tell it how to work. There are functions you can run that don't need any arguments at all. They just perform some sort of task automatically without any inputs. Most functions we use take at least one input and sometimes more, okay? So you can give them an argument like argument one. If you give an argument to a function, you specify an argument like this, you must provide that argument when the function is run or the function will not work. Very often though, we want optional arguments to a function. We wanna be able to write a function that by default it does something, but you can alter how it works by giving it an additional option. So you can say something like argument two by default does this, but you could change that by saying argument two equals something else when you actually run the function. Turns out basically every function you've ever used in R has a whole bunch of these defaults that you've never really had to think about, but you sometimes modified them once in a while. It's like when you give optional column names to read CSV, or you do the mean of a variable, but then you add na.rm equals true. By default, it's na.rm equals false, and you don't even have to write it. But if you want it to be na.rm equals true, you got to manually add it. That's how it was written. It's a default. And if I actually go to the help for the mean function, you'll see it. So, the mean function here takes an argument x, which is required. x is some numeric or logical vector, but then it has this argument na.rm equals false. This means whenever you run mean, if you don't specify na.rm equals something, it automatically runs na.rm equals false, and it keeps all the nns. But if we specify na.rm equals true, it changes the behavior and overrides this default setting, okay? Some functions have a lot of defaults. So read CSV, we usually just give it a file path on our computer. It turns out it also has all these other default settings we don't tend to mess with, but we could. Sometimes these things go really crazy and there's a lot of defaults. ggplot2 theme, actually technically these defaults are hidden from us. How about just uh, read.dilem? Yeah, that's a lot of defaults. These are all default settings for read.delimiter. The only one we ever have to specify is file, but you could optionally change every other one of these options, okay? Somebody manually put in every one of these defaults when they created the function. Okay, so we can do that. I'll show an example using the defaults in a bit. Okay, the next part of a function is the body of the function. This is where the magic happens. Literally everything you want that function to do happens in the body and it can be anything you want it to be. It could be one line of code. It could be hundreds of lines of code, um, whatever, it could all happen in there. It's kind of like the body of a loop. You can do a small thing or tons of things doesn't matter. Functions, put whatever you want in there. Lastly, there'll be a return value. So the return value is what you actually want to pop out of the function when it's done running. This could be something like a vector, a list, a data frame, another function. It might even be nothing. 
Sometimes there's functions you want them to run, but you don't want them to produce anything in the R console at all or any kind of output. I have a function like this that generates my slides for this class and automatically makes PDFs and stuff. I don't want to generate anything in R. It just exists for its side effects, the side effects being the generation of PDF documents and things like that. Okay. Um, if you don't specify a return value, a function just returns the very last calculation that was performed. Very often that's what you wanted to output, but not always. I usually like to manually specify a return. So this is a function in abstract. We're going to apply this a lot and it will probably make more sense in application than in the abstract. Okay, so here's an example of a function. Maybe what we want, we want it, some sort of uh, set of quantiles out of some sort of numeric vectors. Maybe very often we need to just look at the quantiles of data to make sure they're lining up with our expectations. We don't like the quantiles provided by summary. It doesn't provide enough. It like just provides quartiles and a mean or something like that. We want a whole bunch of quantiles. Okay, So here's a starting point for a function that does it that also displays a couple special features. I'm going to call this function quantile report. I'm going to assign to quantile report a function with two arguments a required argument x, which in this case is going to be some numeric vector. I don't specify it has to be, but it's going to give me an error if I don't give it a numeric vector. And then it's going to give the argument na.rm, which defaults to false. So I'm just setting the default for na.rm, and then that's going to get used inside the function in some way. What does this function actually do? It's got a couple steps to it. The first thing is I'm going to assign to the object quants. I assign to this the result of the quantile function. I'm going to run the quantile function on x, which is our input vector. So whatever we input as the first argument to this function just gets sent directly to the quantile function here, it gets passed down to another function. In quantile, I do this, na.rm equals na.rm. Anybody have an idea what they think this is doing? It's taking the false or whatever, ever, what other, whatever else you put in that na.rm at the beginning and pumping it into the actual object na.rm. Beautiful. It's just handing it down. So this is something where I've put, I've created a na.rm equals false option for my overall function, but all it actually does is take whatever value is assigned here and pass it down to a lower level function. Because all I actually care about is removing those missing data from my quantile function. So what happens is, it, by the default, it's going to replace na.rm here with the value false. If I specify it manually to true, it's just going to put a true here. But it's just taking this input and passing it down to this one. This is something that can be a little confusing. You can play with it to see what happens. But it's a way to pass arguments to functions that are down below uh, the function that you've created. Then. In the quantile function, I have set manually set probabilities. I'm just saying the probabilities I want are the 1% quantile, 5%, 10%, 25, 50, 75, 90, 95, and 99th percentile to the quantile function. Here's a question. Can you explain the difference between the argument and the function part again? So not sure exactly what you mean. Explain the difference in the argument. Like the argument is what goes up top, which is the function x na.rm equals false. Mm -hmm. And then the functions are the pieces inside. That's like the quants, the yeah. probs, and the names. So I'm just trying to figure out how they, I'm just trying to figure out again how they like work with each other. Yeah. Okay. So this is something that's like, it, it, the abstract is actually quite complicated. So um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, basically, the idea is that when quantile report is run, maybe it's actually help if I bring it into the, um, let's close this out. Okay, out of my dissertation, I want to look at that. Uh, okay, so we got this function here, quantile report. Okay, so when we run quantile report, so if I say like quantile report and I go, let's do our norm 100 or quantile report. When I run quantile report 100 on R norm 100, what this function thing is actually doing is it's doing this. If I grab this code right here, I could say R norm 100 gets passed down to here. This first argument goes to X and replaces every value of X inside of the function. 
That's all it does is this argument gets passed down and replaces everywhere X exists in this function. Same thing if I said R norm 100 NA dot RM equals true, the code that's running inside the function has basically just passed down and replaced that with true. And then everything else would run. So the result of this is exactly the same as the result of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or a little bit better. It's a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, um, it's okay. It's abstract. <laughs> I'm confused where the R norm came in because the original argument doesn't have R norm. Oh, or this was my input. So literally what I'm doing is this. So I'm just saying like, um, so if I say assign R norm 100 to X here and I run quantile report X, that just goes to this first argument here. So it's exactly the same as running this code here. So this is like the body of the function here. All it's doing is whatever I assign to X here, if I put it in quantile report X, it just is sending it right down into the quantile function. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so it can be any arbitrary thing. I can type whatever I want in here, but all the function is actually doing is replacing every X inside the body of the function with whatever I give as the first argument to quantile report. Okay, yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and it's okay if it still doesn't make any sense. It took me a huge amount of time for functions to wrap around in my brain. Like it's something like, it took me forever to be able to write my own function. I was honestly working in R quite seriously for a, a couple of years before I was really writing any functions myself because it was like, I have no idea what's going on when I do this. It's just not intuitive. Um, so yeah, um, anyway, that's all it's doing though, is it, it passes these things down. So in this example, when I did quantile report R and R 10,000, all it's really doing is substituting this X here has become R norm 10,000 and it runs all the rest of the code. Okay. And if you know what a standard normal distribution's quantiles look like, you know that this thing did what it's supposed to do because the sort of bottom 1% should be about negative 2.36 or 2.35-ish. The top should be about that same thing. Negative 1.64 is about the bottom 5%. Its median should be very close to zero. These are only differ because I only did 10,000 draws from the distribution. Right. So this is an example of writing a quick little summary function. It's not a simple example, but it's a practical one that might be useful to you. Um, maybe you need to constantly generate lots of quantiles like this just to make sure all the moments of your distributions look good. I guess this only gets a two of them, but whatever. Okay. So now that I've shown you that quantile report, you might think about it and look at this and be like, okay, I could run this on like one column of my data. What would happen if I had an entire data set and I want to run quantile report across all of them? I'm still stuck in the boat of having to write a loop. You're not. I will show you the true power of R now. Turns out there's a fully armed and operational battle station ready to vectorize all of your functions across entire data frames. Okay. So writing loops sucks, especially for new coders like most of you. Loops require writing a ton of code. They're difficult to troubleshoot. They suck in every way. I've been writing them for ages. I hate writing them. In fact, I've gotten bad at writing them again because I do them so uh, rarely. Okay. Loops are not the only way to iterate in R. In fact, they're not even the main way to iterate in R. I teach them because they're universally powerful and they're nice to know if we're going to other programming languages. But in general, loops suck and you shouldn't use them. Like a loop, the apply family of functions will iterate over elements of objects. The apply family is the true power of R for iterative operations. The cool thing about the apply function, which I'm going to show you in a second, you don't have to do preallocation. So all that talk about preallocating things and assigning stuff to it, you don't have to do that with apply functions. They do the allocation for you. The main difference with an apply function from loops is they can only use functions. So if you don't know how to write a function, you can't use them. The thing is though, is basically anything you can do with a loop can be done much easier and faster. And I say easier is much easier to write um, than a loop using an apply command. Okay, and they typically run drastically faster. Okay, here's an example. So. L apply is probably the most commonly used and powerful one of the apply function, uh, in my opinion anyway. Uh, it's not the most flexible, but it's very powerful. L apply is used to apply a function over a list of some kind. 
And if you remember, I've tried to emphasize data frames are not matrices, they're lines. You and they are, in fact, lists where each element is a column. This means you can use LApply, which applies over the elements of a list, to do things like run quantile report on every column of a data set. So if I say something like, I would like to run a list apply on the Swiss data set, the function I'd like to run is quantile report. It will run quantile report on every column of the Swiss data set, giving me the results of running that function once for each column. So for the fertility column, these are all of its quantiles. For the agriculture column, these are all its quantiles. For examination, these are all its quantiles. I truncated the other columns, but trust me, it ran for all six of the columns in there. If this Swiss data set was instead a data set with 80,000 columns, it would generate a list of 80,000 elements where each one is a vector of all the quantile reports. So the question is, what is fun here? The fun, the fun in the apply functions is the functions that you apply. So this is whatever function I want to run on every element of this list or data frame. In this case, I said, I want to run the quantile report function here. So unlike many past functions we've run in this class, as its second argument, LApply is taking a function instead of a normal object. It just takes a function as an argument. You could put any function here that can be run once over an element of a data frame. This could be the mean function, and it would spit out all the means of a Swiss data set, which turns out is how the call means function actually works. It runs an apply with the mean function across every column of a data frame. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool, huh? Okay. So maybe you don't want a list as an output. Uh, Jeff, just yeah. to interrupt, are there any such other functions which have like, uh, since this is really kind of different, I am saying like a data frame plus a function in the uh, kind of the code itself. Mm -hmm. So are there any other functions in R that uses this type of uh, 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 syntax? Yeah. Yeah, tons of stuff. And actually, this is what I call, like I said, the true power of R um, is there's a lot of functions. The applying ones are the most powerful ones, which I'm going to show you. And they work for basically every type of object in R you can apply functions over. Um, it turns out it's actually a really common way to operate in R is to um, give an object and then a function you want to run on that object multiple times. Um, it's a very common statement. In fact, there's an entire tidyverse package for doing these style of operations called per P U R R R. The per package is a tidy iteration package for doing basically what apply statements do. Um, I show the base R apply ones because they're sort of universal. You encounter them everywhere. Um, but it turns out this syntax is very common and powerful. You can just tend to be able to do damn near everything you want to do with uh, these things using the three apply functions I'm going to show you. Uh, so these functions usually work on the columns, not on the rows, right? They can also work on the rows. I'm going to show you in a second how to make them operate over rows. Oh, okay. Yeah, they can okay, operate thanks. over any cool. elements, any elements. So you could do an L apply over the columns of a data frame, the rows of a data frame, the cells of the data frame, the elements of a list, the elements of a vector. You could have it work over a list of data frames. You could have it work over a list of lists of data frames. You can iterate over any object that exists in R. Tremendously powerful. Um, but I'm just using data frames as an example because 90% of the stuff you guys work with is probably going to be data frames. Okay, cool. Yeah, but it's universal. Very powerful. I iterate over lists of models all the time. That's one of the most common things I use L apply functions over, where instead of Swiss here, it would be a list of like 100 regression models. And I want to get like a summary stat of each one of them. I'd literally say L apply model list summary stats. And it would give me the summary stats for all 100 models with a single line of code. That beats right in the loop. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So maybe you don't want a list as an output. Turns out you don't have to get a list as an output like LApply likes to do. Downside of LApply, right, is lists suck to work with. You've all kind of probably learned to hate lists, which is fine. They're an obnoxious data type, though powerful. So SApply is a function that works just like LApply. It takes a list of some kind or a vector or something. It runs a function once over each element of that object. But then it attempts to simplify its output. When I say simplify, it looks at the, what was generated by L apply like this. For instance, it would look and see, okay, this right here is a numeric vector 
with named elements, it has what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements. And then it goes down to this next one says, well, this has nine elements too. This has nine elements. So we look and see, okay, we got six things output by this function. They all have the same number of elements. If that's the case, we can compress them into a matrix. S supply simplifies that list output into a matrix where now, instead of being each column being a uh, element of a list output, it instead makes each one a column in a matrix. And then each one of the named objects becomes a row name with the appropriate value for it. It's the same output as this L apply, but it's combined everything together. Each one of these has become a column in a matrix. S apply stands for simplified L apply. So if you are doing an operation like this and what you want out is a matrix, this does it for you. So you don't have to manually convert that list back to a matrix. Okay, so this made our quantile report a little bit more useful. Now we have a big quantile matrix. Well, there's also an apply that doesn't have to work over columns. Maybe you're in a situation where you actually want to run some function across the rows of your data set instead of the columns. There's a generic apply function that allows you to arbitrarily name the margin you want to operate over. So you'd say something like, I would like to apply to the Swiss data set across its second margin. The second margin is whatever the second place would be if you subset the object with brackets. In a data frame, the second thing is its columns. So I'm going to say I'm going to apply to the Swiss data set. Specifically, I want to apply something once to each column of the data set. I want to apply a quantile report. This is the exact same output I got from S apply. But you know what you could do instead? You could do something weird. You could swap this to margin one instead. And instead of going across all of its columns, it would go across all of its rows. And you would get instead the quantile report across all the values in the rows of the data. It's meaningless because all the numbers are different and they're not interchangeable, but you could do it across the rows. You might be in a situation where you're, when you're working with data where it makes sense to do calculations across the rows instead of the columns. With the apply here, you can specify whether to go across rows or columns. If you're working with multi-dimensional objects, three-dimensional objects, you could type margin three and it will go down the depth that is the, um, uh, I forget what's the, the name of the third dimension in an array, but it'll go through the depth of an array. If you have a fourth, fifth, sixth dimensional object, you can go through all these multi-dimensions. So apply is very powerful. The only people who tend to work very often in more than two dimensions are actual computer programmers, um, but you know, Maybe you'll get to a point where you want to do that. OK, so if you remember uh, last week, I showed you an example of loading in an entire uh, folder of data on your computer using a loop. So this is compressing all that code necessary to load in a directory of files using a loop. I loaded in dplyr, the reader package. I got a list of files from a directory on my computer. I got their file paths by pasting together. It's actually a clunky way to do it, but it's illustrative. Um, I got, I said, okay, those files are located in example data on my computer. File list is the list of all the file names. I removed the .csv from them to give them nice names. I pre-allocated an empty list to assign all of the data to. I gave it some nice names. I ran a loop saying for I in sequence along file list. If there's 10 files, this is a vector of the numbers one through 10. Assign to data list this particular named element, the result of reading in a file from my computer at a particular file path, and then bind together all of those files into one data set, and then look at that data set and it's loaded in. This is the first three rows of it, but trust me, it's got 10,000 rows. Okay. From some perspectives, this might be an elegant and fast way to load in like a hundred Excel or CSV files into a data frame. I look at this and I see a monstrosity that has wasted far too much of my time. This is an inelegant and slow way to do this operation. A better way to do this would be to L apply over the file paths and just do it like this. I could say the complete data frame I want to get, I'm going to assign to that the result of L apply across my file paths the read CSV command. So what this does is it runs read CSV once for each one of the file paths. It runs every single one of the read CSV commands, finishes reading them, stores them all as a big list, 
and then pipes it to the bind rows command. I can look head completed data. This is the exact same thing as the prior slide. Here I've L applied over a vector of file paths and read in all the files. That's a pretty cool way to read things in because I didn't have to worry about pre-allocation. I didn't have to worry about naming things, none of that junk. I just said, let R figure that out for me so I don't have to think about it. The less I have to think about, the better, okay? So an even better way to do this would be to let Vroom do that apply function for me in the background. So instead of doing even the L apply, I could load in the Vroom library and say, Vroom up all them file paths, which there could be a thousand file paths here. And Vroom just says, I got it boss. It goes and grabs every single one of those files, makes them all elements of a list. If it can stick them together, jams them together into one data frame, spits it out to complete data in a shockingly fast sort of iteration, spit it out, same data in probably one tenth the time with my L apply, which my L apply was probably 10 times faster than my loop. Okay. So there's always a faster and faster way to do it. The way Vroom is actually doing it is with its own apply statement in the background that somebody else wrote for you. So you don't even have to think about applying. Okay. So there's always layers of faster and faster ways to do these things. Okay. So. An important thing to know about, and it's useful, I think, to everyone, is to know that basically any time you have a loop, you could take your existing loop code and convert it to an apply statement. So if you know how to write a loop for something, you can probably convert it to an apply pretty easily. Some exceptions to this are there certain situations where um, an apply statement doesn't work really well, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. So basically, the idea is this. If you want to convert a loop to an apply statement, whatever you want to iterate over in the loop. So when you say for i in something, this is the something like sequence along x, that will become the first input to your apply statement. So whatever you want to loop over, make that the first argument to the apply. Then the body, all the code that was in your loop becomes the body of a function. You write a function, you put all that loop code inside. That function should take only one input, which is your iterator index, whatever i was in your loop, you make that the input to the function. And then you assign the output of this L apply or, or whatever apply statement it is, assign it to whatever your loop used to store the values in. So the thing you would have pre-allocated in before, you just run the L apply and assign it to that object. It takes care of the pre-allocation for you. So. Here's an example. Let's say um, I want to do a really simple thing. I'm just going to run a mathematical operation five times over a numeric vector. I'm going to create a length five numeric vector I assign to loop vec. Numeric five just creates five zeros as a vector. This is me pre-allocating a length five numeric vector to store something in. So loop vec is just an empty object of length five. I then say, for x in sequence along loop vec. Loop vec, vec is length five, so sequence along it is the numbers one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to assign to loop vec element x the result of x squared. So for the first iteration, loop vec's first element is going to get one squared is one. For its second element, it's going to get two squared is four, and so on. So if I print it, loop vec is one, four, nine, sixteen, twenty-five. That makes sense in a loop. Let's see what it looks like for a vectorized command. For a vectorized command, I don't have to mess with pre-allocation. I don't have to mess with what to iterate over. I just say, I want to create an apply vec. My apply vec is going to be my output. I assign to this the result of s apply over the numbers one through five. What am I going to apply to one through five? The function x squared. The result of apply vec is the exact same thing. This loop and this apply function are identical. They are doing the exact same thing, but the apply statement is drastically easier to write. And if you had a lot of numbers, the apply would actually be faster too. 
but it's actually the same thing. Notice the function I'm running with the ELIP line is x squared. It's just x squared up here, but what I get to skip is the actual uh, allocation or the actual assignment of this. The L apply figures out how to do the assignment for me here. So instead, what it does is it runs all the calculations that would have happened inside the loop first, collects them into one vector, which I then just assign to this thing, and it works. So these are equivalent. And anytime you run into cases where you've got a loop that's a mess like this, you can probably make it into an apply statement like this. It's going to be much less code, and you got to think about it less. Questions about that? The reason I don't write loops basically ever anymore is because it's very rare to run into a loop um, that you can't just convert into an apply statement like this and have it work much better in every imaginable way. Okay, so I will say there is one common case where apply statements tend not to be applicable, and that's in things like um, Markov chain Monte Carlo inside of uh, like Bayesian methods um, and in optimization problems. Um, almost any kind of optimization problem, your calculation depends on the value of the prior calculation. It's difficult to do an apply function um, to make something calculate one iteration and then the next iteration is based on it. It's actually called a type of rolling apply statement. Um, you can do them, but it's a little harder to code. So people commonly write loops to do that. Um, but most of you are not going to be doing that. So you can probably just use an apply statement. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> back to making and using functions. So here's an example of a function, or a function idea that we'll write a function for. So maybe we're in a case where what we want to do is we want to take a bunch of continuous data and we want to break it up into discrete groups. So we have continuous data like uh, survey reported income for a bunch of different people. And all we want to do is break it up into uniform sort of uh, buckets. We want to say this person is in the lowest income bracket, this person is in a high income bracket, so on and so forth. Uh, maybe just because we want to do some visualization or something. Okay. So <clears throat> what we might do is we might, well, honestly, we could just use the built-in cut function in R, but maybe instead we want a function that runs cut for us because cut works by giving it a number of breaks or a number of buckets. But instead, maybe what we want to do um, is give it a a uh, set of quantiles and to break it up at those quantiles. For some reason, this lecture I'm obsessed with quantiles. I don't know why. Anyway, what we're going to do here is we're going to make a function that takes some x again. In this case, it's again a numeric vector. And then it takes some vector of quantiles. And what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the quantiles of our data at these different points. And then it's going to make it so everything between each one of these quantiles gets categorized in some particular bucket of our data. So I'm going to call this function bouquet here. I'm going to assign to bouquet a function of x, x being some numeric vector. And it's going to default to the quantile 0 0.333 and 0 0.667. So it's going to cut it into thirds. because It's going to take everything below this between these two and then above this. But we can change it by giving it the argument quants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set some low value. Then I'm going to set some quantile points and a high value. The idea here is we want to set some breaks in our data. These new breaks in our data that we're going to divide it up to are going to be equal to all of our data from the minimum value minus 1. The idea here is I want to make sure to keep my minimum values in the data. So I'm going to say my bucket starts at a value of one below the lowest value. If I said started at the minimum value, our sort of numeric subsetting uh, for cut would actually exclude the lowest value. So this is just a way to make sure I keep the lowest value. My next cut points are just going to be quantiles of my input data divided up at whatever I specify as my quantiles. So in the function, it's going to pass down the vector I provide as the argument quants to the probabilities in the quantile function. And then at the end of this vector is just the highest value in the data set plus one to make sure I don't exclude the highest value in my data. So everything gets put into some kind of bucket. Then what the function will return is the result of cutting up 
my x input vector by the breaks that were generated by the quantile function. So again, quantile finds the numbers that define different quantiles in it. What I want to do is divide my data up at those points. And then labels false prevents it from being converted into a weird factor variable. You can run this code and convert it to labels equals true and look at the result if you're interested. Okay, so by default, this function produces three buckets. It's going to produce a bucket where it takes everything below the 33rd percentile of that uh, numeric vector and gives it a value of one. Anything whose value is between the 33.3 and 66.7 will get a value of two, and anything in the top will get a value of three. Just creates a categorical variable based on some quantiles. Let's put it into action. Okay. So, again, I generate some normally distributed data because that's just the easiest thing to do because I'm lazy. I could use uniform, I guess. I'm going to use. Uh, these quants I'm going to assign to this 0 0.05, 25, 5, 7, 5, and 95. This basically says I'm going to take my normally distributed data and break it up into everything at the fifth percentile or lower. Everything between the fifth and 25th percentile will be a bucket. Everything from 25 to 50, everything from 50 to 75, everything from 75 to 95, and everything 95 or above. So that's going to be one two, three, four, five, six buckets, I guess, right? Okay, so my bucketed data is gonna be the result of bucketing my data, which is just my random, uh, random normal data. The quants are gonna be the quantiles I assigned here for my data. These are my bucketed data. If I plot them, what I'm doing here is I'm plotting on my X axis, I'm going to plot the buckets I created. So these are the buckets each data point got assigned to. On the y-axis, I'm going to plot the original data. Okay, And then I give it a title. I give it some point size, one of the rare cases I use base R graphics. What I'm doing here is I'm generating a bunch of horizontal lines. The horizontal lines are the actual quantiles of my data that I used up here for these quantiles. The idea is that as the values of the actual data increase, the dots should always be for their particular bucket within their respective sort of sets of quantiles. So the bucket one should be below the five percentage or the five, uh, fifth percentile of my data. So this is bucket one. Bucket two should be between the fifth and 25th percentile. Well, this line here is the fifth percentile. The next one is the 25th percentile. All of bucket two's data lies in between those quantiles. Same thing for bucket three for four, for five, and the top quantile has included, in this case, an outlier when I generated this, all that data gets bucketed in this top bucket. This is a way to discretize your data um, in a way that would be, um, would change dynamically depending on the variable you gave it. It would appropriately rescale based on these quantiles for whatever type of data you gave it. Maybe this would be a thing useful to you in your own work. So here's a great question. How does 0.33 and 0.66 from the last side relate to this? Ah, it's the default in the bucket command. If I removed quants equals uh, the data quantiles, the resulting plot down here would instead be buckets one, two, and three, where these lines correspond to the 33rd and 66th percentile. So by giving it quantiles for the quants function, I overrode those defaults. In this case, I didn't even use them. It was just an example to show I could give it defaults and then override them. So if you run all this code here exactly the same, um, you would have to uh, change, like the plot won't work the same way um, because you had to give it its own quantiles. You have to fill in for uh, uh, where? You'd have to fill in for quantile here, these date that ones, 0.33 and 0.66, and that would work. Uh, you're getting error plot new figure margins too large. Uh, yeah, the reason for that is the actually the little graphics window in our studio is probably too small for this plot um, because base R graphics sometimes don't handle plot window sizes. If you increase the size of that little bottom right window in our studio, it should work. That's a really annoying error. Are you on a map? It tends to happen more often than Max. Yeah, I knew it. Um, yeah, either increase the window size or sometimes it's an X quartz problem. Um, Try increasing the little size down there and run it again and see if it works. 
And if it doesn't, you might need exports, which I have an installation link on the course webpage. Let me know if it keeps happening. A weird one. I don't know why that happens. And I don't have a Mac to troubleshoot. So I'm like, it's always a mystery. Okay. So uh, here's another. Let's come up with another function for this comment. So um, let's say we have a situation where we're working with some data. Like in this case, I've got some data on uh, some sort of proportional data or percentile data um, on schools. Um, but I have some impossible values. So I'm going to create, I created the school data here. The gist of it is that I've got uh, 10 different schools. They're school A through J. They have a proportion passing exams and a proportion free lunch. A uh, proportion of people who qualify for free lunches in schools is a semi-common indicator of uh, like school income inequality and disadvantage in neighborhoods, right? So I look at these data and proportion passing exam, proportion free lunch, we know something about proportions. Something about proportions is that at the very least, they should be bounded between inclusive of zero and one. You can't have negative proportions and you can't have proportions over one. If I look at my proportion passing exam, we see a negative one and we see 99s. We also see like negative 13. If you receive data that looks like this and you know there's bounds on values, these values typically indicate one of two things. One, these were human inputted data and they're typos. Or two, they're types of missing values. Maybe a negative 13 is a specific type of missing value. Like this is a school that doesn't report um, free lunch uh, numbers or something like that, right? So if you're in a situation like this, you might want to remove these values and replace them with missing values in a systematic way. Let's do that. So what we want to do here is write a function to remove extreme values in our data, values that should be impossible. So our goal is a function which takes as an input a vector x. I usually like to use x, but it could be anything you want. Then a cutoff for low values and a cutoff for high values. Then what we're going to do is we're going to output a vector, which is all the values in x except an NA will replace every extreme value. That is any value below the low or above the high. We're just going to clean them out of our data as a general uh, sort of purge of the values that shouldn't be in our data. OK, here's a function to do that. I'm going to call this remove extremes. My remove extremes function, I'm going to assign to it a function. Again, it takes x as its first argument. But then it requires two additional arguments. It requires a low value and a high value. Because I don't know the type of data I'm feeding it. I can't give it a default. I don't know what's going to go into it. In this case, I'm going to apply it to these data that I know are bounded between 0 and 1. But that might not be the case. I would rather have to specify. The way this function is going to work is, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate my vector of x with the low values removed. So I say x with no low values is equal to, if else, x is below my low value, assign an NA to it. If x is not below my low value, just return the original x. So essentially, this is going to fill up with all the original values of x, except where it's below my low value, in which case it gives it an NA. So this has deleted all my NA values. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get x with no low and no high values. So I say assign to this. If else, x no low is greater than my high value, assign an NA. Otherwise, return my original x value. Okay. Then I'm going to return x with no low values and no high values. So for example, if I say remove extremes on my school data, percent passing exam or proportion passing exam, Low values are zero, ought to be nothing below zero. High values are one, ought to be nothing above one. The result is all values between zero and one, all the other ones have been replaced with NAs. Okay, does that make sense? See anything odd in there? Fine, you don't. It's one arcane thing I did in there, but if it isn't arcane, or if you don't notice it, either way is fine. Okay, so this is basically a little filtration function. This is something that can go through a column, clean out values that shouldn't be there, and leave everything else alone. 
So instead of manually coding this all into a mutate statement, I could just run remove extremes on one column. Or I could run it across multiple columns in the data set in a vectorized operation. So the dplyr way to run uh, a function across multiple columns in your data in the way that like an apply function works is the across function in dplyr. So maybe what I have is I have a data set like my school data and every single variable in this data set is a proportion variable, okay? So I might do, I'll get this question in one second. Um, I might load up dplyr and say, I wanna take my school data and then I want to modify the columns in my data frame. I want to mutate across every column except the school ID column. What do I want to do to every column except school ID? I want to, this function, this like tilde here is a formula, but you can kind of think about it as an apply operator. This is basically saying, I want to apply to all of these columns over here, this function over here. This is saying, I want to apply to every column except school, minus school is select syntax and dplyr. Remove extremes, x is equal to period, says send all those columns one at a time to that location. Use a low of zero, a high of one. What it did is it left alone the school column, but then ran remove extremes with a low of zero and a high of one to both for, uh, proportion passing exam and proportion free lunch, okay? If I had a hundred columns of proportions in my data set, this would have run across every single one of those columns. So this works kind of like running an apply statement does, but you can use it in a dplyr uh, command like this. So the question here, where do the functions live after you create them? I see it in the global environment, but if I want to call this function a different project, do I have to recreate it? Yeah, you just make it again, like any other object in R. If you want to use them a lot across multiple projects, you can either create a script file and load that script file, which contains the function, which is the thing I kind of mentioned earlier, or you can put them into your own package and load that using the library command. I typically, for simple functions, I just put it at the top of my scripts and have it there generated every time so I can see it. Uh, but in like something like my dissertation, which I showed earlier, I have a whole bunch of functions I need across many different scripts. When I'm in that kind of situation, I just load that. I have at the beginning of each one of my R&D files or script files, I have a call out with the source function and load that script up so they appear in my environment whenever I'm running functions in there. That's a useful thing. So something I want to mention, um, dplyr, as you've noticed when you're asking me questions about quoted and unquoted variable names and getting confused about it, dplyr by default uses something called non-standard evaluation when you run functions in it, which is very confusing to people that program in other programming languages, including Python, okay? Non-standard evaluation means that you can run functions and refer to variables like in a data set without quoting them. Normally, what you'd have to do in a function like select is you'd actually say like, take the Swift data set and then select quoted fertility in Catholic because what select is actually doing is you're naming something, it accepts it as like a search term or a string and then it goes and runs some function in the background on your data. In dplyr, we don't do that. We don't have to quote them. The weird thing in dplyr and most of the tidyverse is you can either quote them or not, and it works either way. So quoting things as referred to in programming as standard evaluation, um, this is actually really useful because when you write your own functions or you write your like loops and apply statements, it turns out it's actually way easier to pass a quoted variable name than an unquoted variable name in R. We'll see um, examples of this uh, for the next homework. Turns out it's kind of weird. Um, anyway, just know that you can do this. And if you're writing a function, you've got like dplyr statements inside, it's usually much easier to pass quoted variable names. The syntax you have to use to produce, to use unquoted variable names to pass these arguments to the function looks very weird. It involves lots of squiggly brackets. I don't get into it in this class. Okay. So, Another thing useful to know about um, are anonymous functions. So it turns out, um, as you've seen me do a couple times, you can write a function without naming the function and just run it immediately in R. This is called an anonymous function or sometimes referred to as a lambda function. So 
Um, if you don't need to use a function more than once, there's no reason to run it created in your environment if you don't have to. So an example of an anonymous function is something like this. I could say, take the Swiss data set and then summarize across every column in the data set. I want to run the function mean of my variables, dropping missing values, divided by the standard deviation of every variable, dropping missing values. So one by one, it runs through every column of the data set, puts the entire column in the place of the periods, runs each of these calculations once for each column in my data. You might not realize it, this entire thing here is actually a function. It's an anonymous function defined by the tilde operator that lets me run the arbitrary body of a function, which in this case is running both the mean function and standard deviation here across multiple columns in my data set. This in programming terms is referred to as a lambda, okay? Um, this is just a syntax you can use if you didn't want to go and create a function called mean divided by standard deviation and do tilde mean divided by standard deviation. You just write the code for it here. Turns out this is actually a function which R interprets this whole thing as being a function and runs it on each column one by one. That's abstract and confusing, but no, this is an anonymous function. So if you run into trouble using this sort of syntax, you can Google things like lambdas in dplyr or anonymous functions and get help for what you're working on. Okay. Here's an example of running an anonymous function in LApply. So like with dplyr, you can use anonymous functions and apply statements. The difference with them though is that instead of putting a tilde before the function, you have to just write function of x. I could say here, I want to L apply to the Swiss data frame, the function of X mean X na.rm equals true divided by standard deviation of X na.rm equals true. What this is going to do is it's gonna take each element of the Swiss data frame, give it to the first argument of this function, which is X, and then replace X here with each one of the columns of the data frame. That is each element of this. It's exactly the same thing happening with this dplyr statement right here. The syntax is just different. So the tilde operator in dplyr is actually just replacing function x. And instead of using x here, it uses a period. It's otherwise exactly the same. So if you can do it one way, you know how to do it the other way. Okay, it's actually the same thing. The thing that's nice about the dplyr one is uh, it keeps it as a data frame, like a tidy data frame uh, with like this L apply, it's gonna spit out sort of a weird base R style object, but whatever is one's useful to you is what you should. Okay. So last example I've got, or second last example, I have a short one at the end, I'm running out of time, but I'll keep going, uh, is ggplot templates. So let's say you're picky, like me. This is actually isn't even a picky example. You should see how bad my templates are. If you're picky about how you like your charts, you might have some chart with like code like this. So this is an example using the Gapminder data from week two and ggplot. This, what I've done here is I'm doing a ggplot of the Gapminder data. I filtered down to Afghanistan. I'm plotting X a uh, year on the x-axis, population in millions on the y-axis. I'm making a line plot that's fire brick red. I've removed my X label. My Y label is population in millions. My title is population of Afghanistan since 1952. I give it a minimal theme and I adjust my element, my text to be extra large. So a little some finicky stuff in here. So the question is, what would I have to do to make it so that this was flexible for any country? What here would I have to make a, in a function, what would have to be able to be given to it as arguments to make it so I could plot it for any country? What has to change here? Any ideas? Well, you'd have to feed it the country as an argument, and then wherever the country shows up, which looks like under the filter command and GG title, you'd have to um, add the argument in there. And for GG title, you'd have to split up the title to be some sort of a combination of of both both elements of the the sentence. Yeah, dynamite. That's exactly dead on. So we have to write a function that first passes to where Afghanistan is here. Instead, this would be a variable. We could have it pass in like country like here where our function takes the argument country passes it down here and we would use it to 
both filter our data and change what the title says. A slightly more complicated thing is, what will we have to do to make it flexible for any gap binder variable? What all has to change for that? So in this case, what would have to change for like population? Like if you look at it, there's a lot of things, right? So we'd have to change the actual pop reference here in our y-axis aesthetic. We would have to change the text population in millions in the Y label, and we'd have to change population in the GG type. Okay, so if we want to be able to make this flexible for population, life expectancy, GDP per capita, it's going to have to change lots of things in this plot. Okay, well, let's see how we can make this happen. This is what that plot looked like I created on last one population of Afghanistan since 1950. What we want to do is we want to make it so we can change the country. So this could be like population of Oman or Canada or something like that, and it would change the whole plot, but it would also change the text here, population of Afghanistan. So the data would change and uh, the title would change. Okay, so it would look something like this. Population of Afghanistan, population for life expectancy in Peru, right? We're eventually going to make both of these things change. Okay, first thing we want to do, let's make it flexible for country. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this a function called gapminder life plot, assigned to that a function which takes, in this case, a single argument. The argument it takes is country. Just for clarity, I spelled it slightly differently than in the filter, so you can tell when it's a different thing. You don't have to do that, though. So function of country. We've changed a couple things from our original plot. We're going to say ggplot using the gapminder data and then filter down so that country equals whatever country we give to our function. We leave the aesthetics the same. In this case, I'm doing it only for life expectancy. It's still firebrick red. My Y label is life expectancy. That's fine. But then I have to assemble a title. So I say gg title. Let's paste together some text. I'm going to paste together life expectancy in space, the name of the country, space since 1952, because that's when our data starts. Everything else about the plot is exactly the same, but now we have a function, we just give it a country, and it makes a life expectancy plot. That makes sense? Questions about that? Or it's like this. Gapminder life plot, our country equals Turkey. We got a life expectancy in Turkey since 1952 plot because it's passed the actual text Turkey to country to filter the data and to country down here to make it spell life expectancy in Turkey since 1952. So if you had to make a whole bunch of these plots or if you had to make them interactive, like you're making a shiny app and you need to make it change how it displays plots, you code it in like this so they can just pass a variable to it, like maybe they use a menu to do it like a pull down menu and it would dynamically update the plot. Turns out that's really easy. Okay, at least for this one, because it's a little more complicated for the next one. So, see, here's it for Rwanda. Get my delight plot Turkey, get my delight plot Rwanda. Cool beans. Not cool beans in the grand thing, so it's not cool to see a life plot, uh, life expectancy in Rwanda given the Rwanda genocide, but still, you know, need as a program. So, okay, next thing that is more complicated. So the next thing we want to do is let's make it so that people can select any one of the gapminder variables except year to put on the y-axis. So to do this, we actually have to change a lot of things because we have to be able to change the y-axis label on the plot and also change the title at the same time. The easiest way to do this is to make something called a lookup table that will allow us to pass a variable name to the function and have it look up the appropriate text for the y-axis label and the title text. We're going to do it like this. We're just going to manually code it. We're going to say the y-axis label, when the variable is life expectancy, the y-axis should say life expectancy. When it's pop, it should be population in millions. When it's GDP per capita, it should say GDP per capita in US dollars. But for the title text, it's going to be different. When the variable is life exp, it's going to say life expectancy in, and then we'll add the country. When it's title text, the title text will be for pop, population of that country, and for GDP per capita, GDP per capita in that country. 
Okay. The way these lookup tables work is if I say y axis label and I subset it to the variable name, it spits out the text population millions. If I subset title text using the same variable name, it instead spits out population of. So this lookup table allows us to use a single variable name to get different results out that we can use to populate these fields in our ggplot. Let's see how it works. Here's our big final function to do a uh, ggplot that's flexible across different countries and variables. It's more work up front than writing one plot, but it's honestly less work than writing even two plots manually. So there's one tricky thing in here, in that ggplot doesn't normally like taking variable names and aesthetics as quoted variable names, so we use a different aesthetic function. I'll show you when we get to it. So now we have a function just called a gapminder plot. I assign to it a function of country and a y variable. What we do is we say the y axis label is going to be this lookup table, which we're immediately going to subset down to the appropriate variable. So that means if we say gapminder plot with life expectancy, y axis label will immediately be subset down to the text life expectancy and title text will immediately be subset down to the text life expectancy in, and it will immediately use those down lower in the function. So these just kind of get created inside the function. Then I say, we're gonna do a ggplot of the gapminder data and then filter it down so our country equals country like we did before, but I do one more operation. Because I've said I wanna use population in millions, I go ahead and whether or not we're using the population variable, I go ahead and convert it to pop in millions, because why not? That way it's just pre-done whether I want to use it or not. Then we got the tricky thing. Instead of saying AES, I say AES string. So something some of you may have noticed in little mistakes in code is that if you say something like X equals a quoted variable name, your plots didn't work. If you want to use a quoted variable name in ggplot, you got to say AES underscore string. Now what it's going to do is instead of thinking you want to plot the text year on the x-axis, you're now telling I want to go look up a variable named year in this data frame. The reason we got to do that is why there here, we're passing to it the text, life expectancy pop or GDP per capita, instead of the unquoted variable name pop life expectancy or GDP per capita. We got to make sure it knows that we can give it text, so we got to use AES string. It's a slightly annoying, but it's the way ggplot works. Still making a geom line with fire brick red line. Then the title is super dynamic. For a title, we paste together the title text. For example, life expectancy in, then the country like Turkey, and then since 1952. We could theoretically add in also like a year thing and make even the years dynamic if we wanted, but I didn't do it here. Everything else is basically the same, except now the Y label is defined by the Y axis label. If we have turkey and life expectancy, our y-axis label, it's going to look up life expectancy and put the text life expectancy on the y label. Okay, it's super dynamic now. Let's see it in action. Now I can say, yeah. Before we go to action. Um, oh, wait, could you go back? To this? Yes. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the subset piece, the Y um, at the end of the Y axis label and title text. Um, yeah. So, sorry, I was, <laughs> um, the next slide where it had like the Y var at the end of that, that's just saying that whichever one you put into the argument, that once it it's going to automatically subset from one of those three choices of population, life expectancy, like it's, yeah. Yeah, it's doing literally this. Um, so if I run this, it's just quick subsetting right down immediately to it. It creates this vector and then immediately subsets it to the object named pop, thus spitting out population millions. Got it, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny. You create the table and you never actually use it. You just straight subset immediately, but it was the easiest way to do it. Well, I mean, you use it, but you don't use the rest of the table. You just immediately subset it because all I care about is this one thing, 
right? But it makes it flexible. So I can do like GDP per cap and then it works. Just allows us to use the variable in many different ways simultaneously. It's like kind of a super cool way to do it. Lookup tables are a super useful thing once you get used to the idea. You can end up using them all the time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cool. Great question. Um, okay, so big complicated plot text, right? But it means we got this cool thing now, right? I can say gapminder plot, country equals Turkey, y variable equals population, and now it says population of Turkey since 1952, population in millions, it makes a population plot for Turkey, right? Super dynamic. I can then say gapminder plot, country, Rwanda, GDP per capita, and now it's GDP per capita in Rwanda since 1952, GDP per capita, USD. Same function allows us to call completely different plots. This is useful. Like this is one of those things and you're actually gonna do it in your homework. You're gonna generate a function for um, bicycle uh, bike share rides in Seattle back from uh, one of the defunct uh, bike share systems. You're gonna do the same thing. This is something that's really useful, um, in my opinion, mainly for things like making interactive dashboards and stuff. Um, but sometimes you'll figure out reasons you wanna do it this way. It can be pretty handy. I like making plotting functions like this for doing quick diagnostics. Like I have common diagnostic plots I wanna run on like models or, um, columns in my data frame, and I just want to be able to quickly say diagnostic plot this column in my data set, and it spits out a nice, maybe multi panel diagnostic plot, so I don't have to manually code them. Handy little functions and stuff. Powerful stuff that you normally wouldn't encounter in a beginner class like this, but I think it's too useful not to show this off. Okay. So, last example I got is making an operator, one I just put in because um, I hate that this operator doesn't exist in R, and so I think people should know about it. So there's a real useful operator in R we've used a bunch, which is percent in. So if I do something like take a vector of like Canada and United States, and I want to filter down to uh, all the data in the Gapminder data set that's from Canada or the United States, I might say, take the Gapminder data, and then filter so that country is in the US or Canada. If I do that, it's gonna give me only data from Canada and the United States, okay? So percent in is super cool because it allows us to give a vector of things and not have to type like a whole bunch of or statements or something. Um, I could also have just done Canada, United States and put it right here instead of creating an object, but then I would have had to split it over another line, would have been annoying. Okay, so the thing is, what if instead of wanting to look at the Canada and the United States, I thought they are silly, dumb countries and I don't want to include them in my things. I actually want to exclude Canada and the United States. Normally to do that, to invert this statement, we'd have to do something like take the Gapminder data and then filter to not country in US and Canada. So what this does is it does country in US or Canada, generates all those true and false values in the logical vector, and then the exclamation point inverts them so the trues are falses, the false are true, falses are trues, um, and gives us everything but Canada and the United States. This though looks weird. It looks like we're saying not country instead of saying not in, okay? I don't like the way this looks. It always bothers me. It works, but I think it's stupid. And what I think is that there should be an operator for the opposite of, per, of percent in. So what I have always done for years is make my own not in operator. So what we can do is we can make an inversion of the in operator like this. We can invert it. I can say negate the percent in percent operator. Notice I have to put it in back ticks. If you put an operator in back ticks, you can treat it like any other object in R. I then assign to it the name percent not in percent in back ticks. And we have a not in operator. You might be like, what is this? Negate is a bizarre function. What negate does is it creates the logical negation of a function. It's like the exclamation point operate the exclamation point operator, which turns trues to falses, except it turns functions to their negative. So most functions cannot be inverted, but if you have a function which produces logical statements, you can invert that function so that the exact same operation produces falses when it used to produce trues. Negate is a very weird thing. And the harder you think about it, the weirder it gets. Just know that it works, okay? So 
I put it in back ticks and now I can use percent not in like I use the percent in operator. I say gap minder and then filter so that country is not in US and Canada. And I get Afghanistan, Albania, it has excluded US and Canada from my data. This operator I can no longer live without because I always need to do these not in operations. So now you got an in and an out operator. In fact, if you want to name it out, just change exclamation point in to instead out. If that sounds like it makes more sense to you, you can name it whatever you want. It's a useful operator. I think in and out sounds kind of fun. Maybe I should have done that instead, but not in made sense to me at the time. Okay, super handy. So you can make your own operators and that's how every operator in R was made. They put it in some back ticks and they assign some kind of functions to it. If you're curious how pipes work, you can actually look up the syntax for a pipe. They wrote it just like this. It's kind of weird though. Okay. So to wrap up, one thing I want to mention, debugging. If you write some function and it's not working the way you expect and the error messages don't make sense, R has a built-in debugger that will show you how things are happening inside a function as you run them. If you say like debug gapminder plot and then you run gapminder plot, it will step through each line of the code in gapminder plot and all the functions inside of gapminder plot one line by line, just so you can see where things break. Um, you can then turn off GAD debugging mode for that function with undebug the name of the function. I don't use debugging too often, but if you're really like making functions that get serious, it's good to know about debugging. All right. Next one, overview to go back to the first slides I had in this lecture. Data processing operations in general can be really complicated and there tends to be an essentially infinite number of ways to solve problems. Um, my general belief is that if you're going to go attack some new problem, this is the process I follow and I sort of advise some gen something generally similar to this. First thing, look real carefully. Take the time to look carefully at your starting data, what you have to begin with, whatever your data you're working with, and try and figure out what you can actually get from those data. It's entirely possible that those data cannot get the answer you want out of them, so there's no reason to start. This is basically the same thing as if you're starting to write like a new research paper or something. It's really important you look at your data and make sure you can even answer the question you have so you don't waste like a year of your life trying to squeeze blood out of a stone and get an answer that doesn't exist in those data. Begin with this, think hard about it, make sure you're real confident you can get what you want out of it. Next, determine precisely what you want the end product to look like. You should know exactly what you want to produce. Be like, okay, this is going to be a vector. It's going to have these values. It's going to have, you know, for each row, it's going to have this value in this case, this value in this case. Know exactly what you want. Once you know one and two, then you can start. Then what you want to do is identify the individual steps needed to go from one to two. There might be a lot of them. There might be one step. Make each one of the steps involved its own set of functions or function calls. If in any case, any one of those steps is confusing to you or complicated, what you need is more steps. Break it into more and more pieces until you can solve it one bit by bit by bit, okay? Then complete each one of these steps separately and in order. Do not continue until the step you're working on produces what you need for the next step. The next step will be useless to you if the prior step doesn't produce what you want. And then do not worry about combining any of your steps for efficiency until the entire thing works, unless it takes hours and hours to run and you can't continue working on the next step. You don't need the efficiency. It's okay if it takes like a minute to run something. Finish the whole pipeline, the whole chain, then go back and make it efficient later, okay? Then once you're done with this whole thing, if you have to do this process again, convert the steps into function calls or functions, write your own functions to do it so you don't have to go manually do all these steps again, okay? That is the process I generally follow or attempt to follow my lofty ideal every time I'm doing any data processing problem, okay? One last thing, here's a bonus function here, just because I mentioned a couple times in class, this giant mess of a function is the thing that generates the lecture slides for this class. This is a render and print slides function for my class. 
It is a function which takes as an argument the current week of class. So for instance, I ran render and print slides seven and it generated the slides for today. What it does is it looks up the career or it gets all of the directories for all of the different weeks of lectures in my class. It figures out what is the current RMD file for the present lecture in that particular week, regardless of what it's named. It renders that R markdown file. Then it figures out what is going to be the current HTML file it renders to, that is the slides I'm reading off of, the PDF it's going to render to, the R script file that you can follow along in. It renders the HTML file, waits a little while to make sure it's done, generates an R script file for you to follow along in, in the purling down here. It opens up a copy of Chrome invisibly in the background with the HTML file, prints it to a PDF uh, of the slides, um, and lets me know when it's done generating the PDF. So it does everything except update the GitHub automatically to post them. Okay. This is something that I do constantly, but automating with a function means I had to write this once, and then I can generate my slides by doing like render print slide seven. I also have a generate class function, which doesn't take any arguments. I press it and it renders all 10 lectures for the class, re-renders them all from scratch one by one. This kind of thing can really save you a lot of time and energy over time. My dissertation has one of these that re rebuilds the dissertation from the ground up from a single function call in case I got to update something. This kind of stuff can be handy. Your homework uh, for this week is to download and analyze uh, data from the first year of Seattle's failed Pronto bike sharing program some years ago. If you've been an internal graduate student like me, you remember the Pronto bikes. If not, history. So this is another template based one. The difference between this and the last one, it's the opposite problem. Uh, the prior data you got were garbage and impossible to deal with. This has beautiful, clean, pristine data, but it's in multiple data frames. The difficult thing is going to be the programming. So what you need to do is you need to write a loop or an L apply statement to read in the data from multiple files. You're going to generate functions and use those functions to clean your data. And you're going to generate a function to visualize ridership over the first year of this program. Um, there's a little bit of string processing needed in here. I've shown you some of the functions, but maybe not all of them. They'll come in the next lecture. Um, but in the lab, I'll go over and show these things if you show up. Uh, part one is due next week. We'll go over it in lab. Part two is due in two weeks. And then that is the last required homework for this class. The last homework is optional. Okay, sorry for keeping you for seven minutes long because I'm not good at time management. Um, I will uh, see folks on Monday on lab. Got any questions? Hit me up. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. This is more of a like general thing that would probably help me use R much better. Um, is there a place where you can just find a list of like common functions and like what they do? Cause I feel like I go into R and I have these like ideas of what, what I want to do, but then I have no idea what function would help me do that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the most useful ones uh, as a repository sort of these is all the different R studio cheat sheets. Um, there's lots of them sometimes for things you probably don't, need, but there's some useful ones um, uh, for different sort of tasks. Like for instance, if you need to work with apply functions, there's a cheat sheet on how to use apply functions, how to use importing stuff, data transformation is like dplyr, maybe even some tidy R stuff, um, how to work with R markdown. I don't know if there's any base R ones in here. Uh, R markdown. Oh yeah, here's like base R cheat sheets for common operations. So uh, for instance, you can look down thing and be like, well, okay, here's stuff for vectors for general programming, reading, writing data, operating on matrices, lists, data frames, stuff like that. These cheat sheets are really good if you have kind of like, you kind of have an idea, but you just can't remember the specific function for it. Um, but if you have less, like you don't have that good of an idea, um, I generally just Google stuff constantly. It's just that learning the vocabulary can be kind of a pain. So over time, you kind of develop it. Um, but at first it can be kind of tough. And sometimes these cheat sheets are not the most useful thing in the world um, because you're just like, they can be kind of hard to read if you don't already know the syntax for like ggplot and stuff. Um, my thing is sometimes I like to go to, uh, a good one is like the R cookbook. Uh, the R cookbook side, site um, is kind of good for just basic stuff. Like you wanna know how to do basic operations like, um, uh, that's data input and output. How about manipulating data? Um, 
you know, things like, oh, I need to know how to rename levels of a factor. You can browse down here and it has all sort of breaks down all the common operations for renaming, a, like doing some with factor levels. Um, our cookbook is good. It's mostly base our solutions to stuff, but they're perfectly valid ways to approach everything. Um, this is so helpful. What was the first? So this is cookbook R. What was the first one? R Studio Cheat Sheets. Um, so R Studio R uh, has these um, cheat sheets that some of them are made in house by the R Studio folks, but it's also contributed ones for lots, lots of packages and general approaches to things like cheat sheets. Here's is like a base R one, advanced R stuff, data table stuff, um, uh, labeled data. Here cheat sheet for LaTeX. Uh, leaflet, um, you know, there's a million packages here that have their own cheat sheets for them. Here's a cheat sheet for regular expressions, which we'll learn next week. Uh, simple features, geographic data, which we're going to learn in a couple weeks. Um, you know, tons of stuff. How to go from Stata to R. This is kind of like, here's one that shows how to do stuff in Stata and to do stuff in R if you want to move between the two languages. Um, so this is a cool cheat sheet, which I actually didn't know about. I should use because I have my own repository. I'm converting Stata to R code, but this one looks better than mine. Good to know it exists. Um, millions of these sort of like cheat sheets. People start just making because they want to make stuff as accessible as possible. Um, a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is, I just, I feel like there's sometimes even functions in class that we use and I'm like, would have never known that that's what that function does. So I'm like yeah. need like a 101 level. So this is like super helpful. Yeah, um, my recommendation is is often sort of like the the sort of textbooks are usually the best way to start. I usually consider these things, these, these are not so much 101 to me as I consider like the, the cheat sheets to be like 300 level is what I think about them because they're not always the easiest thing to use unless you have a little fundamental understanding of them. Yeah. Whereas like the R cookbook is closer to like 101 level. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And also another thing you can do is if you ever kind of really get stuck with something, shoot me an email. Okay, yes. Google's a scary place when it comes to R, so. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, that's why I try and like, I teach some of the vocabulary and stuff. And like, it's like asking a question on Stack Overflow sucks because the people there are terrifying and mean. Um, and so I try not to do that, but a good place to ask is Twitter. Our Twitter is a very friendly place. Um, uh, R is legendary for having one of the friendliest like online communities. Um, they're just, really, really good. Um, so they really frown on people being dicks. And so it's really nice to, uh, um, to like be in that community. Stack Overflow is a hostile place, but the R world is generally pretty friendly. Thank you. Absolutely. And are, anything else? Nope. Anyone else? Yeah, and the R reddits are okay too. And also if you post stuff for the R reddits, there's a reasonably good chance I'm the one responding to it. Mm. <laughs> okay, let's see, recording.